Madam President, today, February 7th, marks the 60th anniversary of the day the United States economic embargo against Cuba first went into effect. Just think of that, 60 years, it's three generations, 12 presidents, 60 sessions of Congress, six transformational decades ago, and dating all the way back to the middle of the Cold War. The goal of the embargo, which has been expanded multiple times, was unmistakable. It was to depose the Cuban government by imposing a vast web of punitive sanctions designed to crush the Cuban economy and incite a popular uprising. In fact, to be, uh, to be precise, in a declassified April 1960 State Department memo, confidently entitled The Decline and Fall of Castro, it said the purpose was, quote, denying money and supplies to Cuba, to increase monetary and real wages, to bring about hunger, desperation, and the overthrow of the government, close quote. What a remarkable humanitarian attitude on the part of people who had absolutely no idea of what history is or what might happen. 60 years later, hunger and desperation are pervasive in Cuba. But the Cuban government remains under the firm grip of the Communist Party. No opposition party has been allowed to function or to challenge it. Free and fair elections are as elusive as they were 60 years ago. Political dissent is not tolerated. But the U.S. embargo, which we proudly and consistently have kept, is opposed by every other nation in this hemisphere. In fact, it's, a, it's opposed by every other nation in the world except Israel. In other words, after 60 years, we have convinced only one other government, just one, to join us, not a single government in our own hemisphere. This failed attempt to isolate Cuba succeeded only to isolate ourselves. Those responsible for this administration's policy toward Cuba have apparently decided that Despite candid Biden's pledge to the contrary, despite the failure of the embargo to achieve any of its objectives, which the CIA acknowledged in a declassified report back in 1982, and despite a worsening human rights situation, and despite contributing to the misery of the Cuban people who the United States, or who the White House insisted wants to help, there's no reason to change course. Today, hard hit by COVID, and the administration's cut off of remittances and restrictions on travel by Americans to Cuba. Life for most Cubans is an increasingly desperate struggle. Popular protests against the government's mishandling of the pandemic, mishandling of the economy, and autocratic rule have been met with a fierce crackdown in summary trials and lengthy prison sentences, including for young people. I have spoken many times about the stark disconnect between the administration's policy toward Cuba and the reality in Cuba. So I'm not gonna repeat what I said before. I'm as outraged by the crackdown on protesters in Cuba as anyone. Unlike many others, I've actually said that to Cuban authorities. No one condones acts of vandalism or violence, but provocations, abuse of peaceful protesters are inexcusable. I also know that trying to bludgeon the Cuban authorities into submission does not work. What's the proof of that? I've tried it for 60 years, and it hasn't worked. It's only made things worse. It emboldens the hardliners in the government who can then blame the United States for their own failed policies. They're determined to hold on to power, and if they fail on something, they just blame it on the United States. <clears throat> but it hurts the Cuban people, 
impeding their ability to obtain medical supplies as basic as syringes and masks to fight COVID and preventing small businesses from accessing U.S. products. I visited a lot of those small businesses. They actually want to deal with America, and we're cutting them off. It flies in the face of our belief in the power of diplomacy through engagement with countries whose governments we disagree with, especially a country 90 miles away with whose people we share so much in common. Sooner or later, and I hope it's sooner, the administration needs to face the fact that continuing Donald Trump's policy of punitive sanctions and vitriol has backfired. The longer they delay that day of reckoning, the worse it will be. And we can do better than this. We can defend human rights as we should. We can stand up for the right of people to choose their leaders in free and fair elections as we should. We can also do what we do with virtually every other government in the world with which we disagree, find areas of common purpose for the benefit of people in both countries. So, Madam President, on this 60th anniversary of a Cold War policy of sanctions and isolation that has failed in every conceivable way, let us dedicate ourselves to a new way forward that our allies and partners in this hemisphere will support, that the American people will support, that supports the Cuban people, and most importantly, that we can show the rest of the world it's worthy of the United States, worthy of us. What we're doing right now is not. We can do better. We must do better. Madam President, I think of so many young people I've talked to and met in Cuba who are in a different world and can't understand why the United States slams the door on them. We can do better. We have to do better. I pray we will do better. I suggest the absolute quorum.